Hello and welcome to a beautiful, normal winter day here in Cologne. It's rainy, it's cold, it's windy, but it's also February, so we're not very surprised about that. So we have a lot we have planned in the next day or so, um, but also enough time to just kind of walk around and explore the city a little bit, which is exciting. Yeah, so we're going to go to the Chocolate Museum today. Um, and then we also want to look at, of course, the Cologne Cathedral. We want to see some of the Roman ruins and a few other things. So, yes, it should be a good trip. We had to visit the Cologne Cathedral. When you enter the city, the first thing you're going to see are the 500-foot-tall spires in front of this cathedral. Another thing you will probably notice is that the cathedral is completely black. This color was not by design, but it's actually due to the rain and pollution affecting the porous sandstone that the cathedral was built out of, much like what happened to the Black Charles Bridge in Prague. Even so, the black color mixed with the gargoyles and decorative effects normally found on a piece of Gothic architecture like this make it an absolutely foreboding structure. The cathedral itself is the largest Gothic cathedral in Northern Europe and actually has the largest facade of any church in the world because of how its design incorporates the towers into the front of the building. Builders broke ground on this massive structure in 1248, but it was not finished until well into the 19th century due to budget constraints. The inside of the cathedral is spectacular. It has a huge vaulted ceiling and massive pillars that hold the weight of its enormous roof. There are beautiful stained glass windows everywhere, and statues throughout the building. There are even some frescoes and paintings that we didn't feel like we'd normally find in a church like this. In parts of the cathedral there are even mosaic tiles spread across the floor, showcasing some beautiful artwork as well as some shields and emblems. We did go down to the cathedral's crypt, which is available for free, but we didn't film it out of the respect for those buried there. Overall, the cathedral is a must visit when you're here in Cologne. One thing you'll probably notice here is that there are ruins all over the place. It should come as no surprise that Cologne got its start as a major city under the Romans. Roman Colonia was founded in the first century, and it was a major hub of trade, as well as being one of the frontier towns of the empire. In its heyday, there was a huge wall that surrounded the entire city, some of which is actually still preserved. You can find part of the old northern gate near the cathedral, as well as part of the old road that went to the port. This road was found during excavations to build the cathedral, and it's directly outside the Roman Germanic Museum. There are also parts of the Western Guard Towers that can still be seen today, with some of the original bricks laid by the Romans still showing. You can also see some of the newer stones that were laid on top of the wall as the towers were rebuilt over the centuries. Parts of the old wall itself are also still standing throughout the city. This is quite a spectacle to behold, and if you're any kind of history lover, you'll appreciate this when you come here. With all of this history so prevalent in the city, it's no wonder that you can also find the enormous Roman Germanic Museum here. This museum presents a history of the area from an archaeological viewpoint going all the way back to the Paleolithic period. Of course, a large portion of the exhibits here focus on the Roman period and the Middle Ages as well. We were excited to visit this museum, but found that it had been shuttered and moved to a different location for renovations. This wasn't a huge deal, but we were really looking forward to going here. Anyway, we decided to move on in our tour of the city and visit the museum in its new location later. For now, we walked over by the river, 
and got some great views of the mighty Rhine. The Rhine River is one of the largest European rivers and stretches from the Swiss Alps through Germany and into the North Sea through the Netherlands. Because of its massive size, this river served as a boundary between the civilized Roman Empire and the barbarian hordes of Germany for centuries. It's also served as the border between several kingdoms throughout the ages since the Roman period, which is why you can find so many castles and ruins along its banks. We continued along the river walk for a while before making our way inland once again finding one of the most talked about historic locations in the city, the Great St. Martin Church, or Gross Sanct Martin. This Romanesque church was founded in 960, and it's a landmark of Cologne's old town. The church was added onto throughout the years and later became a Benedictine abbey. After the Second World War, the church was in rough shape, and restorations did not finish until 1985. In 2009, the church was once again open to visitors. We thought that this church and its history was already interesting to begin with, but after learning that it was built on an old Roman chapel and storehouse, we knew we had to take a trip down to the basement. Many of these ruins are still able to be seen in the bowels of this church. In fact, this area of Cologne, though far inland now, used to be part of the islands that made up the old port of the Roman city, Colonia. This church was once a storehouse used to store grains and possibly water in ancient times. Whatever its function, the ruins were amazing, and it only cost a couple of euros to see. After spending some more time in the church, we started to make our way back through the city. The old town of Cologne is actually very quaint, and reminds us of many of the other German cities around the area. It was in this location that we decided to stop for a quick beer before moving on. One thing we could not ignore in this area were all of the little displays and statues commemorating the nearly here carnival season. Cologne is a bastion for this holiday, and from November until Ash Wednesday you can usually find people dressed up in various costumes to celebrate this time. However, it's the week before Ash Wednesday, which is always in the middle of February, that these colors really start to shine. Children are generally given off school, people take off from work, and there are huge parades and parties in the street. We were in town just a week before this huge festival, so we were able to see some of the preparations and locations that would be a big scene in the coming days. Making our way a bit further into the city, we came upon a huge reconstruction of the old Roman western gate into the city. This gate is quite large and it takes up much of the square that it's in. It was here that we found the new location for the Roman Germanic Museum. We spent a decent amount of time here and took in all the various artifacts and items that were found over the years, showing what life was like thousands of years ago. It was quite impressive and was worth the entry fee of about 12 euros. Since we were already this far inland, we decided to walk even further. We saw on our map a very large park with a name that stood out to us, Hiroshima Nagasaki Park. Being history buffs, we instantly knew both of these names as being the locations in Japan where the two atom bombs were dropped by the US in 1945. However, we did not really understand the significance of why this park had the name. This park, as you probably could have guessed, is a statement against the use of nuclear arms in warfare and a memorial for the millions of people who died in the war. It's also a memorial for the millions of others who died from radioactivity from nuclear weapons tests, and it's an advocate for a nuclear-free world. There are a few different memorial plaques around the park, and the hills of this massive park are actually built from the rubble of Cologne after it was nearly destroyed in World War II. Another fitting piece to this park is the Japanese Cultural Institute and the Museum for East Asian Arts that are also on the grounds, right next to a very large and peaceful reflecting pool. After spending some time in the park, we decided to take a walk through the famed Belgian Quarter. The Belgian Quarter is known for being one of the most trendy parts of the city. 
With high fashion shopping, a laid back ambiance, and a number of restaurants and pubs housed in historic buildings, it ended up drawing us in. It was in one of these bars that we decided to have a cologne delicacy of the liquid variety. Kolsch. Kolsch is a beer named after the Cologne dialect of German, and it's widely known throughout the region as a lighter variety of what could be argued the German national beverage. It has a bright and clear appearance, and it's served in the typical 200 milliliter Stenge glass. We thought it was a really good beer, and we got it whenever we could while walking throughout the city. After taking a little break in the middle of the day, we headed out towards the Chocolate Museum. The Chocolate Museum is actually located right across the street from another interesting place, the Mustard Museum. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to stop here, but we did stop for lunch before going to the Chocolate Museum. We had to stop for a few kolsches and some pizza. Pizza's here. It's huge. To get to the Chocolate Museum, we had to walk around the Zollhafen, or the port. This area is not really used as a port anymore, but you can still see some evidence of historic use as you walk around. Many of the old buildings that once stood on this port have been removed in favor of huge, new office and apartment buildings. But there are still some of the buildings that kept their brownstone and castle-like appearance. While it was neat to see, the weather was not really cooperating with us, so we didn't want to spend too much time out here. What a beautiful day, huh? Yeah, lovely. I almost need my sunglasses. We finally made our way to the Chocolate Museum. The Chocolate Museum has a very interesting history. It was not founded by some long-standing chocolatier family who'd been working in the industry for hundreds of years, nor was it funded by the government in hopes of bringing tourism to the area. No, this museum was funded and built by Fans Imhoff and his wife, a chocolate lover and a modestly successful business owner. He built the museum in 1993 with his own money to spread his love of chocolate to the world. In fact, he even said that he had a heart of chocolate. In the museum, you can walk through the rainforests and learn about chocolate production and harvesting. You can see old advertisements and exhibits about the marketing of chocolate over the decades. You can also learn about the history of chocolate, both ancient and modern. And one of the biggest attractions here that you can see on your self-guided tour is, of course, a working chocolate production line. Each part of the chocolate making process is explained in detail and shown to museum goers, from the melting to the packing. You can even taste some of the chocolate in a huge chocolate fountain, which we were happy to do. Of course, in addition to making and teaching about chocolate, this place also wants to sell you chocolate, which did not take much convincing on our part. Overall, the Chocolate Museum is a great activity to do on your own or with your family. We saw so many children here, and it was absolutely packed, but we still had a great time. We had an amazing time in Cologne. We got to see so much and learn about this ancient and beautiful city. We were also happy to learn about a new type of beer that we don't really get down in the south. Thanks for watching this video, and we'll see you in the next one.